probably one of the, the uh, most astute commentators uh, about Arab politics and Middle Eastern politics more broadly <coughs> writing and thinking today. So again, we're very, very uh, gratified that he's come to Berkeley. His lecture tonight is entitled The Demise of the Islamist Utopia, What Next? I'm delighted to welcome Hisham Hadley. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Professor Emily, for those uh, very kind remarks. Thank you very much. Um, my speech is entitled The Demise of Islamist Utopia. What's next? It's not so much a demise of Islamism, per se, or political Islam. So it's the decline of their utopia, of what the attractiveness or the appealness on the imaginary that uh, that uh, uh, dream was or that model was. So it's a it's a kind of interdisciplinary approach, and it's also informed by years as a practitioner of observing within the corridors, also of uh, many contacts, a lot of research, a lot of exchange with many of these actors, uh, Islamist leaders across the region, and of course other. Uh, other actors. So, with that said, let me begin. First, I'm going to begin with a little history because I think it's important, even in its track. Some, as a little bit monotonous, I know not in Berkeley, but you all are very smart and, and very hungry for everything. But I think it's very important to start with the history. And this all begins at uh, the ideology we call Islamism today was born uh, in the 19th century when Muslim thinkers like Qurjan al-Din al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdu sought to reverse the perceived decline of Islamic civilization against the onslaught of Western pressures and Western domination. Of course, it all began with uh, the seminal moment and the, the difficult moment for, uh, for the Muslim civilization was it's essentially the <coughs> uh, invasion of Egypt. I think that's the beginning, and after centuries of uh, uh, reflection, uh, these Muslims across the region realized that they were that their civilization was in decline, and they were threatened, and they, they needed to catch up. So these theorists did not call themselves Salafists, uh, the term uh, that would later become a favorite category among Western scholars. Some have even suggested that these. Uh, scholars or roughly indigenous versions of Martin Luther uh, in their call for Islamic reform uh, through internal reflection and external adaptation. Of course, I would take that with a grain of salt. That's just uh, um, one view. In attempting to rescue Islam, however, from this decline, they unwittingly and uh, decentered it. So previously, the central reference point of the Islamic experience was the Ummah community of believers which stretched across space. And there was little need, of course, to compare Islam to any other civilization before then. Why? Uh, because uh, this civilization was timeless and armed and inspired by uh, scripture, whether Quran or Hadith, it was, uh, these sources were eternal and their, uh, their, uh, their, 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 their message was very strong and there was nothing else uh, that could basically uh, take the Islamic civilization off course until, of course, uh, contact with the West. Now, however, Islamic societies were to be judged very nar narrowly by how well they could emulate Western achievements and follow Western patterns of development. This theological squeezing of Islam into Western vocabularies went hand in hand with the creation of new states, of course, after the demise of the uh, Ottoman Empire. The Republican and monarchical autocracies that emerged uh, were creations uh, of, of, of Muslims, but they were not the natural extensions uh, of pre-existing systems. They were mimicries of militarized Western despotism, whether republican or monarchical. And by the end of the 20th century, this dislocation of Islamic consciousness left another powerful legacy. There emerged another generation of thinkers this time who rejected not only Western encroachment, but also the Muslim reaction, the Muslim uh, project of reform and introspection. 
activists such as Sayyid Qutb envisioned a different path. They saw a path of resistance for economic and political liberation, as long, of course, as Muslims understood uh, uh, that they ought not mimic others, but that they had within their civilization enough uh, a strength uh, to impose something new. This birth Islamism, which fused religion and politics into a singular doctrine, prescribed the capture of state power. Under the Islamist banner, groups like the Muslim Brotherhood further delinked the modern Islamic experience from its classical inception. The faithful need not ask what kind of Muslim uh, uh, to be, as the early philosophical and legal traditions of Islam explored. Instead, they simply were to ask their questions, are they Muslims or are they unbelievers? Are they, in, as Sayyid Qutb said, in jahiliyyah? And uh, that needed immediate solution. So Islam's evolution from this spanned the 20th century, unfolding against the repressive pushback of autocracy and the rise and fall of Arab nationalism. Of course, it was pushed back by autocracy, but there was also in moments, there was, uh, I would say, fostering by certain Arab regimes, which saw them as a perfect antidote against nationalism, against leftists. We saw that in Iran, we saw that in Morocco, we saw that in Egypt. Regimes very calmly helped these Islamist uh, 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 movements unwittingly, or deliberately, but unwittingly. Unwitting. The ideology carried most appeal after, of course, the Iranian Revolution, which demonstrated how political activists, infused with religious conviction, could overcome the strongest states, even backed by uh, the West. And I think the, the example by, by Exynos was uh, how the Shah of Iran was overthrown uh, by uh, an Islamic revolution. Here is uh, Jimmy Carter, who uh, basically stood behind the Shah, and basically this is a regime that was overthrown just with the strength of conviction. Another similar energizing moment came with the Soviet retreat from Afghanistan, of course, due to the ferocious resistance of the Mujahideen, of the Mujahideen fighters. This served again as a resounding reminder that, with inspiration from the putative past, the golden age, that uh, Muslims could muster enough power and enough strength to defy the strongest global superpower. Four decades later, here we are. Islamism has failed to deliver, deliver its utopian promise. Except for the rare case of Tunisia, Islamic movements across the region have been neutralized or bankrupt. This took time. Of course, the Iranian revolution did not uh, deliver on its promise. It had uh, problems uh, dealing with the uh, with day-to-day -day problems of economics, the problems that any nation state faces. Uh, the Sudanese example of the Sudanese uh, alliance between the military and uh, the movement of Tarabi showed limitations also. Uh, the Algerian civil war and the uh, violence that it spawned was also uh, a harbinger of disappointments that would uh, bring Later on, the Arab Spring, one of the one of the factors, not the not the only factors. The Egyptian Brotherhood suffered a disastrous year of government before the military coup in Iraq, uh, before the military coup in Egypt, in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Islamist forces uh, were non-factors in promoting uh, the uh, the Arab Springs in their own countries. In fact, uh, they did not really bring about the mobilization, but just picked up the relay afterwards. And in countries where the Islamists did register an electoral gain, like in Morocco, Jordan, or Kuwait, they had no meaningful impact on the end result. The failure of Islamist models comes in three forms, I think. First, Islamist movements failed to offer social and economic solutions. To recite the slogan, Islam is a solution, and the Quran is our constitution, is not the same as innovating new public policies to solve dilemmas of mass unemployment, failing infrastructure, endemic corruption, and uh, the failure to provide uh, goods and services by the state. When empowered to lead the government, uh, the Party of Justice and Development, for example, in Morocco, the PJD, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt had no economic vision. Their Islamist doctrine had no theory of economic production, 
and thus no creative element by which to tie a new social contract with material redistribution that could bring about prosperity. For this reason, they merely reused basically the tools that were used <coughs> by uh, their colleagues in the, in the ministries and the bureaucrats, including neoliberal policies that were already ready by institutional financial institutions. Thus, although they did undertake some interventions into the economy, they extracted no political benefit from them. They had no idea of how these, all these pieces tied together for a new social project. Uh, second, Islamist parties also failed to lead inclusive and democratic politics. Except in, Tun in Tunisia, the argument that Islamists had never been given a chance, I think, uh, now has been basically consumed. Now we can always say, and they will say, we will not give the chance in Egypt. The military stepped in and interrupted the experience. Uh, yes, probably, maybe, but the fact is they did, or they were responsible, without cautioning by any way that coup, they should have been challenged by democratic means, without cautioning that coup, they did commit very big errors. Uh, in Egypt, the Brotherhood appeared more fixated on domination than pluralism and their repeated exclusion of secularist actors advocating a civil state during the military, the alibi it needed. Third, Islamists everywhere failed to prove they were immune to material politics. By this, I do not mean corruption. They ran relatively a clean show, relatively everywhere, uh, certainly cleaner than other political parties. But by this, I mean uh, rather that they often succumb to the temptations of power. They made too many contingent alliances with authoritarian forces. For instance, again, the Egyptian Brotherhood engaged in expedient collaboration with the army, as I said. In my own country, the PGD had cared more for its good relationship with the monarchy, which provided it visibility and new resources in the political space, than advocating systemic change, which they promised before the election. After winning the 2011 elections, its religious discord reflected subordination or stressed subordination to the royal center by emphasizing the retooled Islamic principles of nasiha, which is advice to the ruler, and ta'a, which is obedience to the ruler, which is an element of virtue historically and a certain notion of Islamic ethics. Relegated to the margins were the core principles it promised to defend, such as defending human rights and freedom of expression. Further, it is inherently impossible for the PGE to advocate democratic constitutional change when it refuses, and it has systematically refused, to contest the king's supreme right to educate constitutional matters. And by this, I do not mean uh, the role are arbitrating when there's a conflict. When there's a conflict, yes, a monarch in a, moment, in a moment of transition can arbitrate, but what I'm talking about here is ruling by decree. And they have refused to challenge them. Not at one time have they challenged the prerogative to rule by decree. So the PGAD has come and gone with Moroccan politics remain the same. The PJD now is revealed as a party of not virtue, but entricism. And I use that in the Trotsky sense. That is, entering into the institutions, entering into the political game, entering into the administration to build a clientele, to build a base, and to stay in politics in the landscape as long as you can through those means. And they're willing to ally with any actor so long as it remains a political party in the landscape. Today it is the palace, tomorrow it may be the military, and after tomorrow perhaps the food, the leftovers of any authoritarian system. Beyond these three failures, Islamists faces another crisis. They have become deeply entangled in the geopolitical cleavages and sectarian conflicts of the region. One of the earliest promises of Islamism lay in their pledge to succeed where the Arab nationalists have failed. Nationalism was going to resist, Western imperialism was going to roll back the Zionist project 
of colonizing Palestine, the West Bank, and Gaza, and it was going to resuscitate the dream of regional integration. As time wore on, however, Islamists became mired in the violence and the rivalries that pre-existed their mobilization. For instance, consider Lebanon. Here in the early 1980s, the Islamist group Hezbollah began as an arm of the Iranian revolution and articulated its imperative to spearhead a new wave of radicalized politics. It soon morphed into a nationalist movement fighting uh, Israelis, uh, fighting Israel to liberate, uh, li liberate Lebanese territory from Israeli occupation. Today, under Iranian influence, Hezbollah still claims to struggle on behalf of the Lebanese nation, but in practice, it devotes itself and most of its resources to resisting the globalized Sunnism in Syria. Globalized Sunnism in Syria. There, Hezbollah has proclaimed itself to be fighting on the battlefield of the Armageddon. It is less an Islamist movement concerned with Lebanon's economic and political future and more a transactional actor intent on welcoming the Mahdi. In uh, the discourse of Daesh, it was a millenarian movement in that uh, the land was going to be uh, an area which it controlled was going to be the final showdown before what we would call in English the Armageddon for uh, Hezbollah. It meant first milk first welcoming or preparing the terrain for the Mahdi, before which then uh, there would be the uh, final uh, confrontation and the Armageddon. Same case for Iraq. I think Iraq presents a second example where geopolitics crosswinds have made Islamism disruptive to the project of stable Iraqi state. Yes, Islamists have fought American uh, opposition. Yes. Islamists have fought uh, uh, Daesh, but they could have invested more strength into constructing, devoting the resources and their forces to uh, building a cohesive, all-encompassing Iraqi state. And this was not the case. And especially by forces, Hash uh, al-Shabi, uh, Popular Mobilization Committee, and uh, the Badr Brigades. So Islamism's most conservative variant also fails to meet the test here. And I'm talking about Salafism. Of all the camps of Islamist, of Islamist thought, Salafists, above all, promised salvation through jihad or through quietism, especially quietism. The West's encounter with Salafism has often, of course, taken violent forms, whether it is with the Qaeda or with the Islamic State. And just an aside here, or a very important it's not a footnote, but an important aside. It's not a digression. Contrary to common belief, Salafism is not a prerequisite for jihadi. Many jihadists in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere discovered religion only after their inculcation into the battlefield. And most Salafists today are considered quietists. Quietist Salafism parties proliferating started in the 1990s and after the Arab Spring some have entered directly into politics uh, reneging or renouncing rather that uh, pledge or that attachment to quietism thinking that it was important to intervene in politics this was the moment to intervene into politics the problem is once they did uh, all they could bring back were the same old uh, promises the same old uh, program of bringing to the forefront uh, policies based uh, on Sharia. And if people had abandoned the Muslim Brotherhood, if people had identified problems with the Brotherhood and similar parties, they were certainly going to identify the same contradictions with Salafists. Critically, Tunisia stands as the lone Arab success of Islamist government. Here, the movement of Nahda and secularist counterparts such as Nidat Tunis, have worked together to establish democracy. It's still not consolidated. It has crossed the threshold of electoralist democracy. There are there are dangers, of course, lurking ahead. But something has been constructed nonetheless. And Nahda is a significant party with a popular base, with a strong leadership. 
contrary to an Tunis and other secularist parties, which remain collages of nationalist business elites and the remnants of the Benali regime. However, the Tunisian case is the exception that proves the rule. And Nahda succeeded in the rarest of circumstances only by moving away from Islamist ideology, albeit under sustained pressure from civil society and democratic forces. Of course, during the, uh, the debate period, we can discuss what makes Tunisia very unique and why it's so different from uh, Egypt, where the transition in 2011 has uh, failed. <coughs> In Nahda had been different in many, many retrospects, and the regime was different, of course, in many, uh, many, many, many different ways. Further, in Nahda's electoral victories in parliament did not result in ideological domination, but instead compelled the Nahda's leadership to compromise by softening its demands on the constitution, by learning how to separate its religious a message from the political platform and by entering, by crafting alliances with many of the counterparts on the other side of the fence. In doing so, Tunisia has come to embody one of the pathways for Islamists to remain politically relevant and to participate in new bargaining arrangements. This is called the twin toleration and the term has been dubbed by uh, the late theorist Alfred, Alfred Stepan who basically uh, uh, entailed or who basically outlined the conditions under which uh, both uh, religion and uh, secularism can cooperate or collaborate. In Tunisia, Islamists have accepted that no interpretation of Islam can trump uh, the crafting of uh, foreign policy or domestic policy. And on the other side of the fence, the secularists accept that uh, religion can be part of the public space and uh, can be debated in the public space uh, and in some creates the space from which one begins to construct a <coughs> order. Such flexibility and compromise are inherently rejected by many Islamists. Yet they can be found in the early experiences of Islamic civilization. In the centuries, uh, after the Prophet, Islamic thinkers realized that though the sacred texts contain holy words, their interpretation and their application are very much human acts. And like all human actions, they must be regularly questioned, debated, and adapted to the times. In the classical period of Islam, the problem was not posed, of course, in terms of secularization. It was posed on how to live one's Islam in time and space. And Islam also in the tradition, the Zaman, the place, and the time. The dialogue between the sacred and the profane, the human and the divine, embodies Islam's religious political duality, not the insistence that one should destroy the other. If Islamism is not the solution, then what is? What is the solution? Well, the Arab Spring gave the beginning of a solution, the beginning of an answer in the form of democratic politics, popular sovereignty, and the reclaiming of dignity. Though much of the region has slipped back into autocratic rule, it was a very strong cry for normality. It should be stated that prominent cases of Islamist breakthroughs happened. Islamists did win elections after that. But it wasn't because of some uh, grand scheme or grand ideological tra trajectory, it was for very objective reasons. Islamists were better organized, Islamists were there on the terrain, they were perceived like in Tunisia as being <coughs> among the biggest victims of the authoritarian state, they had participated in the struggle, so there was a reason for them to win. It should be stated, however, that uh, uh, the aftermath of that has become clear that Islamists cannot be saviors. Their grand utopia, one that promised salvation in return for adherence, has failed. Neither has a democratic utopia. So both utopias here have failed. Therefore, we are left with the same problematic that Islamic, Islamist, Islamic reformists faced more than a century ago. We retain religion as a foundation. We want progress. 
we want also to be able to live Islam in a modern way. Yet none of the positive utopias promised by popular movements have come to fruition. Today, the religious landscape of the Arab world is defined by two simultaneous trends. The first is the increasing anti-clerical attitude that manifested itself during the Arab Spring, which I stated earlier was a cry for normality. I struggled very hard to find the word. I couldn't find another word that I used, it's anti-clerical. There's no clergy in Islam, but you have to know that with the creation of the modern state, the, the, the bureaucrats and the functionaries that were in charge of policing the religious space became, in fact, a little bit the equivalent of a clergy. This is something totally alien to Islam, and we can talk about it in the, uh, in the, in the discussion. So, for lack of a better word, this anti-clericalism has really uh, taken root and it's broke out in the open with the Arab Spring. So it deserves a few words. Individuals have become alienated by the instrumentalization of sacrality, or the notion that certain figures, such as president, sovereign, Islamists, and state-appointed ulama, jurist experts, inherently command the quasi-sacred status, and thus deserve a kind of uh, obeisance, a kind of awe. Authoritarian regimes have identified these two trends very quickly, and they have understood and they have adjusted their strategies in this shifting landscape. Let's talk a little bit about that. I think it's worthwhile. They have entered the normative arena by imposing their own interpretations on morality and faith for their societies. Recent examples abound in the Middle East such as stringent informants of Ramadan fasting, the uh, uh, fighting blasphemy and uh, atheism, and of course, the apex of hypocrisy, or what we call it in Islam, Nifaq, is uh, fighting so-called uh, uh, adulterous people, those who have sexual deviances, and so forth. The repertoire is big. In dictating these social rules, autocracies cater to unspoken conservatism among citizens while cracking down on the emancipatory desire of youth. That desire for emancipation, emancipating norms and culture, is compounded by the failure of the Arab Spring. Because the, the, the Arab Spring has failed into building institutions, into building political liberalism, Youths have started to fight for liberality, if you will, for the right to be free. And as such, it is the liberality, no longer the liberalism, that has become the target of these regimes. And as such, they have adjusted their strategy. So the state's response is to both this fight for liberality on the parts of youth and for the fact that many in the society have a quest and a yearning for identity and have conservative values, traditional values. So it caters for both. Sharia, for instance, let me say a word about Sharia. Sharia is, simply put, uh, a corpus of findings, a corpus of laws that apply to Muslims that regulate <coughs> Muslims' lives, whether it is in Mu'amalat, meaning uh, relationships and institutions, or Ibadat, meaning the transcendental relationship with God. But it's also something else. It is a constant quest to find the truth, to perfect this journey of every Muslim and how it is embodied and shrined in the what what he or she must do in terms of uh, uh, following uh, prescriptions by the Hadith and by the Quran. It is, in a sense, a methodology about extracting from the sources the truth. The official response has been to sidestep this complexity. Regimes are not interested in debates over Sharia as they were before, because remember, there is anti-clericism. So what are they interested in instead? Rather than re referencing a crude way 
in order to legitimate autocracy and, con and control rules. They want the outcome of theology without going through the process of theology. That is, their dictates are not Sharia specific, but Sharia latent. By contrast, regimes are now attempting to regulate behavior by appealing to norms rather than scripture. As a result, normative goalposts are constantly moving with no fixed reference points that could define what religious purity or authenticity is. Because they are not referring to Sharia de jour, but Sharia de facto, this is discretionary, and this is based on their own whim and based on the decisions they talk, they take in an ad hoc way. So the goals, keep, the goalposts keep keep moving around, and as a result, many Arab publics exist in a state of wandering, caught between different moral categories, but not fully lured by any. In the past, engagements with Islamic doctrine took place in a realm of scripture, where absolute truths could be deduced. Now it's completely different. Imagine for a second, two poles. You're a devout Muslim that practices Islam every day, whether in society or whether in Islam. And then on the other side of the spectrum, a secular Muslim. Believes in God, but is not very observant. And can drink alcohol and so forth. Now, in the middle of that spectrum, there are many variations, many combinations, many permutations. <coughs> Some who would be devout at home, but who have, uh, but who have uh, a conception of religion that is about open interpretations of Islam. Now, <coughs> the state responses regulates or tries to intervene in that entire space, and it does that subjectively and with discretionary power. Because remember, we're not in Sharia anymore. We are in norms. We are in norms that are presented as cultural expressions of our proud, cultural expressions of our uh, uh, national sentiment. They're never couched in religious discourse. In fact, when youths are arrested for eating Ramadan, when they pass in front of the judge, usually it is not about violating scripture. It's about uh, uh, touching public order. So you see, you see the difference. And it's very important to realize that. These state interventions into the public sphere have profound long-term implications, not just religion, but the future of democracy and stability in the Middle East. When regimes attempt to appropriate norms and values, they expose internal contradictions as well as external limitations. Uh, all regimes in the region, or most regimes in the region, function like this, of course, with, except, with the exception of Tunisia, as I said. I'm just going to give you two examples of two countries I know very well. They happen to be two monarchies, Saudi Arabia and Morocco. And Saudi Arabia and Morocco embody this dilemma. And they come about with strategies that are very efficient, but they're very different. In the case of Saudi Arabia, the aggressive economic and political moves of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, dubbed MBS, have been widely covered by the media. More recently, <coughs> Some sinister practices have come to the surface and they are still in gestation. We have yet to know where they lead. But less visible are the religious reconfigurations occurring as well. In the past, the partnership between the House of Saudi and the Wahhabi ulama, the latter of which embody conservative Salafist ideology, alone allowed for a certain equilibrium. There was a distribution of tasks. The monarchy retained political supremacy and endorsed the religious establishment, which in turn enjoyed theological eminence to issue edicts and control Islamic doctrine. In the old arrangement, the partnership between these two partners provided what we can call soft power. Soft power, in the case, in, as defined by Joseph Nye. The regime's new Islamic vision today radically breaks with this. The regime wishes to control Wahhabi discourse and religious rulings fully, relegating the ulama as a state-controlled organ whose primary purpose now is to legitimate policies dictated from above. They do not legitimate the, 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 the monarchy. The monarchy is legitimating them, which is very different. And the process resembles Egyptian state's cooptation of its Azhar 
and its independence, and the independence which is slowly lost with the weight or under the weight of successive military regimes. Thus, the Saudi leadership is folding Wahhabi soft power into the state's hard power, eliminating the autonomy of the Sufi regime by making it fuse or coterminous with the state. Thus, the Saudi leadership is folding Wahhabi power, as I said. Paradoxically, this is the only success of MDS. Economic modernization has stalled, while foreign ad adventurism, whether in Qatar, in Yemen, in Lebanon, have suffered setback. The assassination of Jamal Khashoggi is, apart from being a despicable human being, a human, uh, a, a, a atrocity and a violation of human rights and a murder, it is also a failure in international diplomacy and in international relations. It is stupid and it is a disaster. So it is a failure to put on the same level, although it touches just one human being and not an entire population, it is to be put on the same level as a disaster of Yemen. This religious project does not moderate Islam. Now you are here university students or academics. You know what moderation means. But imagine any person, Lambda or X bar, as a statistician would say, moderation for them is something else. Oh, they drive the cars, they go to the cinemas, and women them. That's moderate. Moderate. What does moderate mean? So rather the goal is to recalibrate Islam, to amplify a new brand of rentier authoritarianism, is to recraft the way in which religion is instrumentalized to build legitimacy. And this has been a success. This is MBS's success. Now it can yield positive results. Uh, you have less Salafis running around the world uh, engaging in, in, in jihad. That's one of the problems of Salafism, by the way. Salafism, Salafists have won in the Islamic <coughs> space. But they do not have anymore those resources or that ideology that is now, that was before the finance from the Gulf. It's financed in different ways, more discreetly. So that is one of the reasons why uh, uh, Salafism is on the way. Now, by turning inwards, the regime is also surrendering its global leadership of Salafists. And there are very concrete steps to this. For example, Saudi Arabia has reduced or abandoned its patronage of mosques in Geneva or Brussels. So in a historical perspective, when we're going to look back at this period, we're going to say that this is a hyper-compressed process of state building. By contrast, let me switch to my own country, Morocco, which offers another example, a very, very sophisticated example that's on the other, on the other pole of the spectrum. So Morocco's paradigm of religious appropriation prioritizes soft power over hard power. The Moroccan state has projected its vision of Islam along the north-south axis as part of religious diplomacy. This strategy has multiple, multiple goals. First, towards the European north, Moroccan state enlists Western support by broadcasting a message, again, of moderate Islam to combat radicalism and terrorism. Morocco, which has long claimed a rich, a very rich tradition of Islamic teaching is now training French imams, as we know, for this purpose. Second, towards the African South, where Morocco projects itself as a new African economic political center of gravity. In turn, this seeks to isolate and to contain Algerian influence, which is fair game. Third, this enables and I won't take much more of your time as I wrap up this example in Morocco before we have questions. Third, this enables greater, greater control over the Moroccan diaspora in Europe for religion functions as a method of political monitoring and regulation. Moroccan regu religious institutions in Europe, such as the Brussels-based Council of Rilema, cater to religious matters. These are the objects of intervention by Moroccan diplomatic consulates and security services that work in tandem and seek to influence those living outside the homeland. Finally, this religious strategy comes back or doubles back to enable the state to reshape social development. 
Well, again, moderation is projected outward to the outside world, at home. State bigotry persists under the cover of protecting public morality with official state Islamic councils, targeting minority groups, targeting homosexuals, targeting adulterous people, and thwarting religious debate. Beyond all these immediate aims, the ultimate function of this strategy of soft power is to sustain the traditional foundations of authoritarianism. Moroccan Islam abides by constitutional position of the commandership of the faithful, and thus the apex of religious authority. Yet the commandership of the faithful also exercises a political imperative to preserve the status quo, which means controlling the religious space because the retention of popular sovereignty, the constriction of religious uh, sovereignty, is done in the name of Islam, in the name of religion, more generally. And it's the same way as uh, it is basically uh, what was the case in, in the European monarchies uh, uh, before the Age of Enlightenment in Europe, and during the Age of Enlightenment to some degree too. However, all these religious political arrangements, whether Saudi Arabia or Morocco or other examples which I, would, which I could not go into here, face three fundamental challenges. First, its ultimate test will be economic in the absence of successful, sustainable economic redistribution. Social actors find it difficult to give unflinching and unconditional support or obedience. Second, this arrangement is a bricolage of religious ideas held together by political power. As such, it will be challenged at any time by a coherent religion or, or theological knowledge as expressed through Islamic history. We've seen it before, <coughs> and we will see it again. Islamism, which we talked about the same quote, is one such a response based on a theological corpus, whether we agree on it or we agree with it or not. Because the very notion of moderation here is tricky. Moderation does not mean secularization. Rather, in this case, it means domination of religious space and the appropriation of legitimation. Thirdly, and especially in the case of Morocco, the insistence on the part of the king to project a non-traditional and modern image creates a Hegelian contradiction with this policy of advancing an Islamic soft power strategy as it's been deployed and as we discussed earlier <coughs> in this presentation. So one last word, again, with this issue of moderation. So indeed, moderation is inherently autocratic because it requires dictating the, the boundaries of religious discourse from above. The true, true goal should not be to moderate Islam, but to create or to create the conditions for the emergence of an enlightened Islam. Yet enlightenment requires critical thinking. It requires debate. It requires a certain degree or a complete degree of freedom, intellectual freedom. And this is the supreme enemy of any authoritarianism. Thank you.